My name is Billy Dosange, and I grew up here in Smethwick, in the West Midlands, in the 1980s. It was a time of massive change, but then Smethwick has been changing ever since the 50s and 60s, when thousands of Sikhs began to arrive from the Indian Punjab. They came to work in the steel foundries, pushing molten iron in threadbare gloves. My family and its tight-knit community meant growing up here was much like growing up in a Sikh village that had been transplanted from the Punjab. That's me in the white T-shirt. When I was a boy, the Sikhs were the largest immigrant community in Smethwick, celebrating their traditions together. And weddings were a really big deal. They were the key events in the Punjabi calendar, often lasting more than a week. In the late 90s, I moved from the area and went to London to study. But I haven't lost touch with the place of my childhood and I've always been fascinated by the marriage of two traditions, British and Sikh. It's best expressed by what has happened to love and weddings, as many of the oldest traditions are kept alive and others let go. <laughs> This is the story of the Sikhs of Smethwick, past and present, told through two local weddings and the first generation of men who arrived here full of dreams and hopes of making their way in Britain. You don't often hear about the Asian foundry workers of the black country but they left a real legacy in this part of the world. Before the women arrived, the men came over largely on their own. From a world where money was scarce, healthcare non-existent, most were illiterate and tradition ruled. Houses left the Punjab in northern India in search of work. My dad was one of them coming over in 1964, aged 14 and on his own. This is him a few years later. It was an epic journey. In those days, Smethwick, just a few miles north of Birmingham, was the heartland of the steel industry. The men came to work in the foundries. Manjit Uppel works in a local quarry. Every day, Manjit pops by to see his parents, who are now in their 80s. His dad, Colonel Uppal, was one of the earliest foundry men. <laughs> Manjit's dad was one of the first to arrive in Smethwick. Lots of the early arrivals never learned even basic English and to this day live in an isolated Punjabi bubble. In the Smethwick area, 90 factories were crammed into five square miles, but the riches of the black country came at a cost. My father says people are getting injured left, right and centre with hot metal, it's like water. Uh, just going through your clothes, there's no personal protective uh, equipment, there's no gloves, there's no hard hats, there's no uh, steel toes within. You're, just, you're wearing your normal clothes with well, three layers of trousers, four or five layers of jumpers. Fingers crossed you, you're not going to get splashed with a bit of hot malt. Gandasi. 
The hardship and danger of the work was a vivid backdrop to my childhood. One story I can't forget is of a couple of guys who took shelter from the cold and fell asleep in a hot room. They couldn't read the sign on the door in English and they were sleeping in the furnace. Work resumed after the break. The door was shut and the furnace turned on without anyone seeing the two men inside. My friend Balbir Pachungi works at one of the remaining steel factories in Smedic. He's combined working in a factory since 1963 with being a Bangra singer. That's a traditional storytelling troubadour of the Punjab. He has become the laureate of Smedic Sikhs and remembers the hard work of early life. <laughs> When I was in India, they were saying uh, England is like a heaven and uh, angels are living down there and uh, so many uh, beautiful people living down there and uh, somebody told me it's a glass houses houses made of glass and the road made of robots they say it was like heaven england when i came here and uh, it was a different story smedic is a real railway town Nowadays, the areas round the tracks are derelict epitaphs to the Industrial Revolution. Today, the insular guts of the street communities are rotting away. Slum clearance has upset the generations, and to add to the feeling of insecurity, there has arrived an army of total strangers, immigrants. I was stunned by the archive I discovered of my hometown. It brought to life the poverty of the time, the harshness of the work, the isolation of the first Sikhs he couldn't integrate. And, of course, the racism that our arrival triggered. I think it's pretty awful. Uh, I think they should live uh, in a district all to themselves because I've got to bring this little boy up uh, amongst them. And um, the, they're not clean. And the smell of the cooking makes you feel sick. Some places were even out of bounds for non-whites. Such were the concerns about the outsiders. Our duty is to the public to give them the bingo that they want. We advertise bingo at certain times and therefore, come what may, we give them the bingo. Now listen carefully to this Indian's conversation with a white barber when he entered a saloon with a BBC radio microphone in his pocket. No. Not No. Is it, uh, no. Uh, anything, anything wrong? Yes. Boss, what is it? I said no. But I'd like to know what is, what is the I'm matter. Closed. I'm closed now. Don't clear off. Look, if you give me any reason why boss is the matter, then I shall go if you to tell me. I'm closed. I'm closed. You're not closed. You're not closed. You're not closed. You're not closed yet. To the English people, I would like to say they are very nice people. But indeed, one sometimes there are black sheep in every society. Sometimes some mischievous boy st stands on the road, he starts hooting on the colored people. Hey, black, uh, hey, yeah. black. Has any white man seen our colored people hooting on the English? Oh, white, oh, white. Never. This is Smithy near Birmingham. Coloured immigrants form one in ten of the population. And in 1964, tensions came to a head when a man regarded by many as a racist became the local MP in the general election. The news put Smethwick on the global map. 
Actually, what he says in the archives sounds to me remarkably similar to what some people are saying today, who are anti-immigration but deny they are racist. Do you think you really will be able to fulfil an election promise to stop immigrants coming into Smethwick? Well, I haven't made an election promise to stop immigrants coming into Smethwick, of course. But uh, what I have said is this, that I'm in favour of the most strict control of immigration uh, so that we make sure that uh, the immigrants who come in here do not create problems. Smethwick became the focus of wider community tensions in Britain. It was so notorious that American Black Panther and civil rights campaigner Malcolm X came on a fact-finding mission. Though white citizens of Smethwick didn't mind the immigrants working in their old and dirty factories, few wanted to know about them socially. As coloureds moved into the four-roomed houses, white people found fault with their habits. They disliked their noise, smells, and above all, overcrowding. What the locals didn't realise was that most Sikhs could barely speak English. The majority were single men. You could call them peasants, straight from the fields of the Punjab. They had no women to look after them. I can see, looking at the archive, that for them, life was simply a matter of survival. Any thought of assimilating into the local community was out of the question then. Manjit Uppal, whose father had the same experiences, knows his stories well. My father lived in Smethwick, and uh, I was sometimes asking, I said, Dad, how was it? He says, how was what? I said, how did you live? He says, 10, 12, 15 people in one house. Men, all men. Uh, how did you live? How did you sleep? He says, son, you don't want to know. It was hard. He says, we used to share beds. Half of them used to do night shifts, half day shifts. One lot will go disappear in the morning, the next lot will come in and they'll sleep in the same bed. Everybody had his own duties, cooking and cleaning, washing the linen. It was difficult, but they made it work. In 1967, the government passed the first Race Relations Act, but it needed more than the law to change people's attitudes on both sides. I think the Sikhs had to adapt too. And as time passed, even though many had failed to see it, moving to Britain began to change them. Richer from the work, they started to buy houses and became more established in Smethwick. They were like locals now, and so, at last, started to bring their womenfolk over. He is often forced to work very long hours in conditions that others would be reluctant to accept, both to pay high rents and to save the money necessary to bring his family to Britain. Many came as boys and returned to visit the Punjab as men. Moneyed men. Back into a culture where a month's pay in England was like a year's pay on the farm. This film from 1975 shows a Sikh man taking his school child daughter to India to marry. Marriage was a great responsibility for the head of the home. The girl had no say, and as here, didn't even meet her future husband until the wedding. Here the men negotiate the matchmaking deal. The fathers chose the partners for their children, quite different from the British custom of marrying for love. Forty years ago, the singer Balbir was married. In those days when Sikh marriage was always arranged and many women were flown to England, neither side had a clue about the person who was destined to become their life partner, for good or ill. Hello. First time I seen her, first time I met her, that was on the airport. I didn't see in her face before. <laughs> she, they showed me photo. They sent me the photo. I said, oh, she's all right. Then we met uh, first time on the airport. And then it was like arranged marriage on those days. It's not, uh, it wasn't a uh, love marriage. You know, we, we didn't know what love marriage means. So that's it since then. Uh, nearly 40 years, next year, 40 years, 40 years, 40 anniversary. 
when I 15, 16 years old in India, I think what a uh, uh, singer, I got married, who is the singer? So my uh, parents, um, you know, um, choose him. I love her and I write few songs on her as well. <laughs> I recorded few songs on her. Shall I give you two lines? Kaliyan ghatama tere baal soniye Sapni je to anu sambhal Meri ambiye Sapni je to anu sambhal I write this song on her. In the old days, the traditions of northern India were transferred, lock, stock and barrel, to Smedic. This is archive of a Punjabi Muslim wedding, arranged just like a Sikh marriage, with a go-between matching the couple up across continents. My father said that, uh, he told me what kind of girl I would prefer, and I told him what kind of he girl... He told you what yeah. kind of girl you would prefer? Yeah, and I said that she must be sensible, intelligent, must be able to look after the house. What an overwhelming experience it must have been to travel 8,000 miles as a team to a country you didn't understand. But what does she think of the weather? It's just lovely weather. Good. In these days, especially. And has she met any English people? Yes. You? Only me. All the business. Balbi's wife Amajit made a similar journey to England. She arrived in Smethwick unsure who her husband would be. Yes, I first met him. I didn't know who I was. 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 <laughs> Out of these traditional beginnings, there were often happy endings. Today, Pam Kaur is a successful primary school teacher. When only 16, Pam was expected to leave school to get married. In those days, tradition dictated that young Asians should wed in their teens. Pam grew up in the Punjab, but was orphaned as a child and moved to England to live with her brother and his wife. I mean, my life was totally controlled by, by my brother and sister-in-law. I had no say in it. I finished school and um, that was it. My life was in the house. I wasn't allowed to go out or, or do anything. And, and I, I met a friend recently, uh, just about uh, three months back, and, and she said they found it really strange because one minute I was in school, next minute I was gone. And, and it was like I just disappeared. As soon as I finished school, that was the end of my friends. I never saw them or met them again. For Pam, her wedding is still a vivid, if traumatic, memory. She was part of a tradition where it was typical for women to be told whom and when to marry. We had to go to Heathrow Airport to collect my husband. They called over the antenna, um, can Pam to call, please come in to collect, blah, blah, blah. And um, I remember thinking, oh, my God, <laughs> how do I recognise him? Because I wasn't even allowed to see a picture of him. You know, I didn't know what he looked like. He, you know, he could have been anybody. So I remember walking into this uh, sort of corridor thing and there were, like, lots of men sitting with, with turbans on. There were some elderly men with white turbans, all, you know, different sort of age groups. And I thought, God, how do I choose? Who is he? I don't know. And uh, then somebody in the distance sort of stood up and waved at me and he had a, a brilliant smile and I didn't even know what he looked like. All I saw was the teeth, you know. And um, he obviously must have recognised me. I, I didn't know what he looked like, so I went over to him and he said, it's me. <laughs> um, I, I picked the right one.
I remember the day I got married and I, I think I was quite sort of scared and I, I made a vow with myself that day. I made a vow with my God and I said that if my life was anything like my childhood and teenage years had been, I was going to commit suicide because no way was I going to live um, sort of um, the suppressed life that I'd lived uh, as a youngster. But the arranged marriage, surprisingly to me, offered Pam an escape from the virtual imprisonment of her childhood. My husband, he, he, was, he was a wonderful guy. He was very caring and I, I, can, I can honestly say that he made me the person I am today. In 2009, Pam's husband died, leaving her a single mum. Her daughter Sonia was born in 1983, which puts her in the same age bracket as me. And like me, she's a thoroughly modern second-generation British Sikh. Sonia works at the Prince's Trust. She's getting married in a few weeks. My parents barely knew each other before they got married, and I think today there isn't that pressure that, you know, you're meeting this person, you have to marry them. It's more of an introduction, you know, um, get to know this person. If it works, it works, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. And I think taking away that pressure has been a massive impact on arranged marriages. Sonia's marriage is everything her mother's was not, a modern love story for a modern British Sikh woman. For me, the change across two generations is astonishing, thinking of Sonia's mum, Pam, at 16, like so many other local mothers, marrying a man she'd barely met, and of Sonia, marrying for love. Centuries of tradition have been thrown over in the blink of an eye. Back in the days of my childhood growing up in Smedic, many of our parents or grandparents couldn't even read or write, let alone speak English. Most of us local kids had to fulfil multiple roles if our families were to survive. When my father uh, came in the early days, he's been here um, 60 years plus. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, why haven't you learned any English? He said, son, he said, we didn't have time to uh, read or write and learn. I says, why not? Because we was working 24-7. Every hour, what God said to us, we was working to bring in yourself up, your brothers and sisters. So when there was communication, we had to communicate for them. Take them to the doctors, take them to the medical centres, the hospitals, uh, issues with taxation, anything and everything. When the phone rang, we used to translate. It was difficult because of the, um, the terminology. We was young, we was still growing up. My mum had the same challenge and spoke even less English than the men who worked. I remember in the neighbourhood how many of our uncles were employed at the Ackles and Pollock factory. Lots of us lived across the road from this place. The men always said factory life was one place for them and another for the English speakers. Do you mind if we have the day off tomorrow? Do you mind if I have the day off tomorrow? Do you mind if I go home early? Do you mind if I go home early? Do you mind if I have my tea break? These Asian workers are being taught basic English in the unusual setting of a Midlands engineering works. Asians on the shop floor often speak little or no English. And on top of that, they come from very different cultural and social backgrounds. This makes a real problem for the foreman. Not only does he have to resort to sign language, at times he may completely misunderstand why the Asians behave as they do. For example, with their religious customs and their habit of offering gifts. Gifts for the supervisor are just one of those flash points of misunderstanding which lead to anger, resentment and prejudice on the shop floor. The Asian tradition of showing gratitude or appreciation by token gifts is easily mistaken for bribery. Because the area had changed so quickly, with immigrants arriving and white British leaving, some schools were almost all Asian by the 80s. The newspapers from the time were, I think, quite perceptive about our lives, understanding the rapid cultural shift that had taken place from farm to factory, from tradition to modernity. The Telegraph wrote, 
coloured youth culturally travel a distance which can be measured in light years. And one newspaper spoke about their careers. Among immigrant children leaving school, the top jobs were electrician, motor mechanic and television repairman. At that time, too many bright and talented Sikh kids were held back. They were committed to family duty. Few made the journey that I and many of my generation have made. And because our community stuck together, there was suspicion of outsiders, and girls were often kept at home. The Sikh culture, with its strong emphasis on manliness, still prospered. This is the game of Kabaddi being played in Smedic in 1979. <laughs> Events like these were all-day drink-ups for the men as they'd gather in their droves for some traditional festivity. I can't begin to imagine how many of them drove home drunk or never made it home at all. Here, a local police officer explains the rules of the game. He's got to listen to them saying, Kabaddi, 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 Kabaddi. What's That's the point of that? The idea is not to breathe. Yeah. whilst you move away from the touchline. So while you're an attacker, you can only take one breath? That's it, one deep breath, and you start saying that. That's the idea, is so that the referee can listen to you saying that, and then he knows that you're not breathing, you see? Yeah. It's a bit like the kids' game tag we used to play as little kids. Same sort of, yes. But a lot more vicious. Very vicious. As we've seen, the Sikhs had originally come to Smedic to work in the steel foundries of the black country. But in the early 1980s, many foundries were swept away forever by the deep recession in manufacturing. The very jobs the men had come for were gone. The ones who spoke no English were often especially unlucky. The drinks they'd enjoyed in the pub became an escape. To be unable to earn, to support your family, while longing for home, all meant many men struggled. Alcoholism was all too common. Many in the neighbourhood lost their jobs. Those who could began to make their own work. Some men in the markets, my father one of them, flogging jeans around the country, and others with small shops or as taxi drivers. Today, Smethwick is one of the most deprived authorities in England. The work, or what there is of it, is largely low paid and manual. It was this that gave me the impetus to leave. But you could say that the recession had one benefit. For women, it forced them into the workplace. The need for income overcame the Sikh tradition that the wife stayed at home. When we started first, I thought, well, they can surely be trained. They are not doing nothing at home, you know, just idling away their time. I, I remember when we started, we had only a couple of girls. It was a problem, real problem. They were not used to working. So once they got the knack of it, now you can see yourself in the factory, you know, how skilled they are and how happy they are. But happiness wasn't for everyone. The recession, and the changes it brought our neighbourhood led to some tragic stories. My friend Dallas' dad was a hard worker, but also really stubborn. He 
He lost his job at the foundry but couldn't kick his gambling habit. He and his wife lived with us for a while as she worked in the sewing factory to save money for her house. Dallas' dad couldn't face the shame of his wife working, his kids becoming British and his sense of personal failure. He lost his self-respect and drank more and more, until finally no one knew what to do with him. We've no idea where he is now. He simply disappeared. But for the second generation, who had been forced to adapt and assimilate through school and work, things were, I think, getting better. Manjit managed to keep working through the recession, unlike his father, who fell out of work for a time. At the end, in 1984, Manjit met his wife. Theirs was an arranged marriage, but they were allowed to meet before the wedding. It was a sign of how things were evolving. With Manjit, we were introduced to each other and we felt very comfortable with each other. All we did was have a chat for about an hour um, and then we made a decision and I think he said, well, he obviously said yes and I said yes. Um, and then we got married within five months. I got married in 1984, 4th of March. It wasn't a very expensive wedding. It was um, some working man's club, probably about £30 to hire, £30, you know, for the whole day. And um, only the men went, the ladies didn't go. At that time, women attended the wedding ceremonies, but wedding receptions were for men only. He looked quite nice, actually. He was very handsome in them days, very slim. You know, he, he, he was quite an attractive man. And you know what middle age does to you? He's gone grey a bit now, but that's no big deal. He's still the same guy, the same personality and everything. I love this wedding video, with his hidden details from our 80s community. Watching the men tear it up on the dance floor and that deep camaraderie. There was always a sense of joy amongst the older men that they were celebrating in a golden land as first world pioneers. Manjit's dad was in his pomp here, fully leading his community as one of the earliest arrivals. The values of the time were far more traditional than today. Manjit and Slinda's daughter Anita is third generation. She's a successful college trained beautician and is marrying for love, but is a match with a man who her parents have known and approved of for years. For me, it seems a good way forward keeping some of the old and building in the new. Today, for the first time since her own wedding 32 years ago, Slinda is showing her daughter her bridal dress. This is what I got married in. It's really nice. I thought you said you'd think it was yeah, old-fashioned. Nice. Look at that. Mm. Like Slinda before her, Anita will be following the Sikh tradition and moving to live with the groom's parents. Do you ever get married in something like that? Uh, or is it still not good enough for your <laughs> these days taste? It's beautiful, but it's not something I'd wear on my wedding day. No, but it's still wedding really day, beautiful. But yeah, it is it's really nice. It, yeah. It's like a timeless classic piece. She designed hers. I just hoped for the best. <laughs> I really did, honestly. Can you imagine what it must have felt like, Anita? Finding out the night before what you're going to wear. No way. How are you going to feel when she leaves the house? Uh, I've no idea how old... <laughs> well, I'm looking no forward to the idea. space. No idea, have some sort of an idea. Well... A little bit of that. I'm looking forward to the space. She does have a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. As in, as you can see in this room, it's not all wedding stuff. This isn't all my stuff. Well, a lot of it is wedding stuff. But how are you going to feel when she leaves on I'll Saturday? I'll be very sad <laughs> to see Anita leave on Saturday because it's my little girl. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll be very sad to leave because see her leaving. She's been with me from birth. She'll be just leaving our family to join another family and start a new life with them. So I think I'll be quite sad. But I am happy she's not really going abroad or, you know, far away. <clears throat> I'm only 20 minutes down the road though. Yeah, I know, but still. Like I'm still part of the family. Today's younger generation sees Smethwick as their home, not the Punjab and regard themselves as British first, not Punjabi. But it doesn't mean they kick away their Sikh identity and his rich culture. Far from it. This is the singer Balbir's daughter, Parvinda. So let's practice. So on the Pungra freestyle, make sure you're always smiling. She's as keen as her dad to preserve the music of her forefathers. Parv is a thoroughly modern British Sikh, but she has visited India many times and had her wedding there. So what, you got married recently, so how does that differ to like the way your mum and dad got married? Um, obviously the, you know, having not met and only seen her picture and obviously seen her at the airport, you say that to our generation kids and we're just like, so you didn't text or you didn't FaceTime? <laughs> but um, I think those days were totally different. Um, I was quite fortunate to meet my husband, you know, through work. And um, we've got both cinema kind of interests and hobbies and personalities. And those, those kind of things, most likely, they probably wouldn't have known until they got married. And we try and find a connection before we get married. And Parv's right. Modern matchmaking is a world away from matrimony 40 years ago. Today, schoolteacher Pam's daughter Sonia and her fiancé Ravi are having their pre-wedding photos taken. Ravi met Sonia at work. They are getting married in just a few days. Seeing Sonia meet Ravi and how she interacts, it gives me a lot of satisfaction. I, I feel so happy for her because she's marrying somebody that she's going to love and who's going to love her in return. You know what it might be? I think it might be... Um... Ravi's parents moved to the Smedic area to find work in the 60s. They then moved to Canada, where he grew up. Thanks, dear. The bird just pooped on my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's good luck because we the wedding. It's a good omen. Yeah. What makes their marriage thoroughly modern is that Ravi is a Christian. Generations ago, English missionaries converted many Indians. If Sonia had married uh, Ravi 30 years ago, she would have been banished from the Asian community because she would have been a bad girl, you know. But this day and age, it's all very equal. There's so much more freedom. They, they can say anything to each other. I mean, like I say to Sonia, you know, you should speak with respect to Ravi. And uh, she says, why? I can call him Ravi. I mean, when I was growing up, uh, you, you did not call your husband by his name. It was something that was unheard of. In this community, it's still unusual for a Sikh girl to marry a non-Sikh. Sonia is bucking that trend aiming to have two ceremonies for two separate faiths. I think we're both fortunate to be having both our faiths represented on the day. Some will have never been to a Gurdwara and I'd imagine there'll be some that have not been inside a church or a cathedral. Mixed marriages are still controversial for British Sikhs, as they are in other faiths.
many in the older generation lament the passing of the old customs. For them, the traditional romances are the best. Here at the Punjab Garden allotments in Smedic, many of the first generation have, in spirit at least, returned to their farms. <laughs> Gathering here, the men sometimes fear for the future. But one custom that hasn't changed is the woman's family still paying for the wedding. In the early 90s, my female cousin moved in with us from India before she got married. We were a family of seven living in a two-bedroom house. You couldn't say we had cash, but somehow, at a duty, my dad found the money to pay for it all. As we pushed the car away, we pushed our cousin into a new life in Southall. Today, there seems to be almost no limit to the expense as weddings become ever more lavish. Manja and Slinda's daughter is getting married in a few days and they're doing a final checkup on the wedding venue. They've both been saving for this day since Anita was born. And with Indian weddings, you can't really have, a, you know, you can cut out, cut out people, but we've still ended up dwindling down to about 650. Our English friends are absolutely amazed. How the hell are you going to cater for so many people? I mean, six, seven, eight hundred people nowadays is just a drop in the ocean. It's, it's just like, so what, so to speak. But if a family or parents have got simple menial jobs, 95 jobs are basically a minimum wage, uh, it's, it, it's a very big financial burden on these families. I've known families to remortgage houses to fund their children's weddings. I think my children's generation or their children will be just inviting 50 to 100 and that's it. Because my parents are obviously paying for this wedding and they've it's all about I'm their only daughter, I'm, it's their first child getting married, I'm the only daughter, so they're paying for this wedding. They, put, they want to put on a big, lavish, very over-the-top, extravagant event. But I have found it quite challenging because I remember initially my dad was saying 1,000 people. For many Sikhs, weddings are a ceremony with rituals to perform, not all of which are well understood. Surprisingly today, it's often the young third generation Sikhs who seem most committed to sticking to the old ways. 
at the local temple. Anita and her fiancé Uman get a tutorial on what the ceremonies actually mean from two guys my age who are practising Sikhs. You guys have got that, that knowledge of why you're doing this stuff. There's a lot of people that come here, they don't know. So they don't feel the connection. So when they go away from it, it's just a routine. Because our parents told us to do it, and it looks nice on the pictures, and it's just tradition. We do, this is how we get married. Even my parents don't know everything. Well, they don't know any of this stuff that you've told me. So it's nice to actually know the meaning behind everything. Yeah. This day and age, when you talk about fourth generation, a lot of people are Sunday Sikhs. So they come to the Godda, Mata Dek, put their money in the garden and go and eat longer and that's it. Anna, back in the day when we were growing up, we used to spend like, because there weren't no shops open on Sunday, so we used to spend all day Sunday. So we were still Sunday seeds, but we used to spend all day here. Anna, playing here, doing whatever, doing some, if you could do seva. Like many young British Sikh couples today, Anita's having a traditional wedding. It's a ceremony that lasts over three days. Now, she's preparing for the first day. The ceremony is a way in which you can bring together the different generations and joyfully celebrate your Sikh heritage. The tradition is to wear something so plain um, and simple, with not too much embroidery or bling on it, not too much patterns or anything going on, but really simple. And it's kind of about being really humble. Because these traditions go back, obviously, years and years, it's about being just quite simple. On the run-up to the wedding, you don't really wear any makeup. You're quite stripped back, um, especially the events following up to the wedding. So then on the actual wedding day, it's a bit like, wow, that simple girl, she's now a beautiful grown-up bride and she's adorned in jewels and she's really blingy and it's quite a statement. It's actually quite dramatic. <laughs> and then everybody, they'll all get a piece of this, it's like a doughy texture, and it's rubbed into the skin, so like my hands, my feet, my arms, a little bit on my face as well. And the whole idea is that turmeric's quite cleansing and brightening as well on the skin, so it's about cleansing you and it's all about purification as well. <laughs> on his granddaughter's wedding day, Canel Uppal has come to watch. He might be Anita's granddad, but in terms of lifestyles, they are poles apart. Within two generations, they've gone from a simple farming family to a modern British one. But weddings like this show the past is not forgotten. <laughs> I think the traditions are very important to me because they get lost as time goes on and as a child I've seen these traditions although I've not understood them very well um, but I think if I don't do these traditions they'll end up getting watered down and lost. Another threat to tradition is the gradual merging of Sikhs into the wider population. Many Sikhs of Smedic, like me, are moving away. We can't bring the old time back. We used to have just uh, Punjabi people in the Smedic. Then a uh, lot of uh, come from Pakistan. And uh, it's uh, like mixed mix culture now. Recently we had a lot of people from Europe. They're finding with difficulty speak, speaking English. Well, that's the one uh, difficulty for them. Second one is the finding job. The people who want to job, they can get job. There are so, so many hard jobs like night shift and uh, evening shift. Uh, the, the jobs there, people don't want to do it. You have to do them. But that's the only way you can uh, survive. Smedik is, for now, still a place for Punjabi weddings. Balbir and his daughter Pav have been invited to Anita's jungle. We've got the pre-wedding party and it's called like the Jago ceremony. And um, that is, the tradition is where it's my mum's family. It's pretty much their party for me. They walk in with, it's like steel jugs and it's a tradition that's come from the Punjab. The women carry them in on their heads. They've got little candle lights on top 
and in India they actually go around the villages, they wake up all the neighbours and they sing and dance and they twirl around with these big jugs on their head. And it usually happens in the night as well, that's why there's candles on, the, on top of those big jugs. I've tried to educate my children that we need to stick to our roots, we need to stick to our culture. Do not let go of our culture. It's absolute paramount to educate our children's children as well as to where your parents and your grandparents and your great granddad actually came from. It's a very, very difficult balancing act. And I can see third, fourth generation actually letting go of our culture eventually. It'll be sad, but I can see it happening. It's the morning of Anita and Uman's wedding. Manjit and Slinda look on as Anita completes the binding ceremony of the Sikh faith, the Anand Garage, a process they went through themselves 32 years ago. Since that time, our once tight-knit communities have changed and moved on, with families that now span continents as well as generations. When you grew up in a Punjabi world, life was simple, with its unchanging rituals and rules for everything from food to marriage. Of course, it's a challenge to adjust to the seeming anarchy of life here. Families start off clinging to India and only slowly accept they are British. It's not been an easy process. Anita and Uman's kids will be fourth generation Sikhs and who knows where that will lead. Will they try to preserve the traditions that make the Sikhs the people they are? Or will our customs be swept away by the modern world? And Sonia's big day with not one but two weddings has come at last. It's taken months of planning with the Anglican Cathedral and negotiating with the Sikh temple. Sonia and Ravi have challenged tradition in a very British way. Sonia and Ravi have given their consent and made their marriage vows to each other. They have declared... I didn't want my kids to experience what I'd experienced as a child. You know, I wanted them to know that they were trusted and that they were loved and that I, you know, I wanted them to have a life. I didn't want to control their lives. And I think by doing that, they've become sensible, intellectual, young adults. I therefore proclaim that they are husband and wife. Would you like to congratulate them? A generation ago, this marriage would have been practically impossible. The fear of the community's reaction that marrying outside of your religion would bring would stop all but the strongest love matches. It's still not fully accepted today. There's a quick costume change before the Sikh temple ceremony where Sonia has a service her mother Pam most wanted before a congregation of Sikhs and Christians. <laughs> They walk around the Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh Holy Bible, four times to be pronounced man and wife in the eyes of the faith. Good. 
she's finally married. It's all our dreams come true, basically, after all the tension and stress. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a relief. I just want to go home to bed now. <laughs> the last step in a Sikh marriage is when the bride leaves her maternal home. It goes back to an era when the farewell was a sort of bereavement, as brides would leave to another village, perhaps never to see their parents again. I think every woman in this room has been through it, you know. Either their daughters have gone or they've left their parents' house, so they've all experienced it. And I think that's the emotion that sets in when, when, when the daughter leaves, you know. It's basically cutting the apron strings, I think. Sonia waits upstairs as Ravi and his family come to collect her. Hmm, now's the hard bit. <laughs> the last bit. The custom is you have to barter. They're going to put up a little bit of resistance and uh, ask for money in return, so we'll, uh, we'll see what... Where we uh, where we get to? Groupies. <laughs> Not dollars. No groupies. After a sum is agreed, Ravi is allowed in. <laughs> Once downstairs, there's even more of a mood change. The final realization: the bride is leaving dawns heavily on her family. I can remember since the very first Punjabi weddings I went to how affecting this process is. Sonia is only going a few miles down the road, but just like my parents' generation leaving the Punjab for Britain, marriage has always been a rite of passage of both loss and gain. Having taken this journey with me through 50 years of the Sikh experiences in Smedic, from the harsh realities of the earliest factory workers to the modern lives of their children, you've seen a community slowly become Blethi. That's Punjabi for English. We're all Blethi now. And watching the traditions get passed down and adapted, it's clear this town's history is part of me. And yes, I'll probably even marry here.